Hello, TubaHero37 here. Just moved into my new place. I just got internet here yesterday and already it went out for a little bit. So that is exciting. Makes me glad that I've already kind of decided to retire the uh, D3 Hardcore for this season. I don't anticipate it being reliable, but maybe that was the fluke and it'll be completely fine going forward, in which case uh, next time I do play D3 long term, I wouldn't mind doing hardcore again. But obviously if my internet, like I've said this many times in the past, if my internet were ever to be spotty or my power were to be spotty, I would just rather play on softcore uh, when I play Diablo 3 or any other game that has such a choice. So as I was going for a walk today, I remembered that somebody had asked for a Yuliana's guide if I was going to be making guides, and that sounded like a fun idea, so I'm going to try and do that. Hopefully, you know, nothing goes crazy while I'm making the guide, internet-wise, but we'll see. All right, first some general tips that apply to many builds, including Yuliana's. So for a number of reasons I'm going to talk about later, our damage goes up massively when there's lots and lots of enemies around us. Uh, this can include elites that have a chance to die eventually, but even if you don't plan on killing them, if you have a big open map, you want to keep dragging them to a conduit. So you want to be able to survive around elites as well as kill lots and lots of trash. So one thing is massively helping us with that is that we have endless walk in this build, which is really good for survivability because anytime you're kiting, when you aren't trying to kill anything, you're just worried about kiting, you get 50% damage reduction, which is double toughness. What's unfortunate about that is if you're trying to like kill something on this screen and then kill something on this screen, and let's say you couldn't dash there in one second, but you were actually like running, um, that means that you have to wait for a long time. You have, you have to be prepped at your location to actually do full damage. So anywhere that you are trying to deal massive damage, you probably want to be settled down before physical so that by the time, at some point during cold, you're able to do a massive, massive amount of damage. So as far as stat priorities, I kind of go with the same stuff as I go with everything else. I'm missing an area damage roll that I'm going to put here in a bit. I switched from non-ancient Lion's Claw with good rolls to this one with not as good of rolls, but it's ancient, so it will be more damage and more recovery and more defense. So it's going to be better, but um, in the meantime, I lost one roll basically. So the old one had cooldown and area damage. This one will not have cooldown. I'm going to put that on the Enchantress. Basically, um, you have the choice between cooldown or elemental damage. Elemental damage is what I would pick if you happened to have cooldown everywhere on gear. But I want this to be in the upper 60s when I have Gogok up, so which means around 60 to 65 before I have Gogok up. Like almost every build, we want to have lots of crits. We want to have about a 10 to 1 ratio. Like that's optimal, but it doesn't really hurt your damage that much if you don't have it optimal. Like if you had, let's say that you had way more crit chance than crit damage and you could only pick one crit on your gloves... Even though you would prefer crit damage generally, I would not go for 50 crit damage over 10 crit chance if you were choosing between those two things because it's just like twice as much benefit out of picking crit chance over picking crit damage. So even if you had, say, uh, 350 crit damage and you already had 50 crit chance, then I would just bump that to 60 with the gloves. I would not go and make it 50 and 400. I'm pretty sure that would be far less damage than going for crit chance. But if you, you have equal opportunity to do either one, then try and make it a 10 to one ratio. Okay, ideally we would have 40 cold damage and 30 exploding palm damage. So the funny thing about exploding palm damage is it is an additive multiplier. There's some passives, some other things are additive, and assimilation is also additive which this gives you 5% more damage for every enemy you hit on your third punch. It gives you a number, um, and you really want that to be a high number. 10 plus, 20 is really good. Um, so if it's ever, let's say, subtract 3 from 20. If it's at 17, and then this 15 brings me to 20 total, I've like doubled my damage. But really, at that point, this isn't 15% more damage anymore. 
be closer to like 8% more damage. Um, so if you have really good things to choose from here, like a thousand main stat or 6% crit chance, often that's going to be better than exploding pollen damage. Whereas on your boots, like Dex and Vit are really easy to get. So you're it's really going to be unlikely that you're going to find a pair of boots where you have to question whether or not to put Exploding Palm on them. And also the Dex and Vit rolls are lower than on the helm. So really, really, you should put down the boots. But on the helm, it's a little more up in the air. Maybe on non-ancient, for instance, it would make more sense to go for a Bifecta early. And of course, if you're like 4,000 Paragon and you don't need the main stat anymore, then by all means, try and get Crit and Exploding Palm on there. So we really want area damage, crits, and cooldown wherever it's easily obtainable. So you could get a quadfecta gloves would be better. Since we're a dual wielding build, we can pretty easily overdo it on crit damage. So maybe uh, early season decks, crit chance, area damage, cooldown are actually the most optimal roles. And these are just what I got. So another thing that you can get on Ancient Rings is an average damage roll. I wouldn't go for it on the necklace, but that can be comparable to a crit roll, or you can get in addition to crit rolls like this. Now, unfortunately, that means that this one came with no cooldown or area, but like those are all, that's like five different things are all really, really, really nice to get on rings. So it's actually a little easier for this build compared to some to get like good trifectas. Like, obviously, 5% cooldown is a bit sad. Not maxed legendary is a bit sad. But anyway, because uh, there's five things that are really, really good to get. And the worse your weapons are, the more the average damage being ancient and high, like, the better that is. So I think last time I pushed, I was still using a non-ancient Lion's Claw. And so that really benefited having another roll of big roll of damage, even though it's pretty small compared to weapon damage. Speaking of weapon damage... Um, this is the Lion's Claw I picked out. It's a little interesting how I'm going to roll it, because if you look at it and you're like, oh, that can be a trifecta. It can have percent damage, um, life per hit, and either cooldown or area damage. There's definitely a time and a place for that. But in this particular situation, if you look at my main stat, it's about 18,000. This has about 900 decks. So that's about 5% of my total main stat which means it's like 5% of my damage. A plus 7% damage roll only applies to this weapon. It doesn't add plus 7% to this roll. It doesn't add plus 7% to this roll. It only is this weapon, which means it's probably closer to a 3% damage increase. Now, if this was a non-ancient, because it's hard to get a well-rolled Fist of Az, maybe you're running with a non-ancient, uh, then you might rely more on like an ancient lion's claw being the bulk of your damage but really this is less than half of my damage because i've got an average roll here that's a little bit and then this is about equal to the lion's claw so this is basically like three percent is what that seven percent actually means versus five percent almost from the decks and that also gives me armor 900 armor out of this which is not inconsequential so we are definitely rolling off the percent damage for area damage. Um, earlier, I was using elemental damage here. Okay, so this is really easy math. We currently have a third extra cold damage, which means if we're adding a chunk, in this case 10%, you take a third of that away, and that's how much you effectively gain. So instead of gaining 10% here, I'd gain 6.7%, you know, one third less than 10 missing 3.33 so it's 6.66 repeating percent is how much dps i gain from selecting this okay so by switching from my non-ancient this ancient i'm going to be losing that 6.7 percent increase because i had to replace the cooldown from the old fist but oh my gosh i get so many more benefits out of this i i'm gonna have a higher dex roll the old one other one had no dex roll i'm gonna have so that that's like 1400 dex between the aug and that and i'm gonna have more life per hit that's so much defense and that's so much damage and a bigger base damage it wasn't even a well rolled base damage non-ancient um yeah here it is it was <laughs> it was not that great other than as a stat stick because i like all three of those stats 
but the DPS was very lacking. You can see right here, it says negative 20.1% if I switch back to it. So definitely, definitely worth, um, even though I'm gonna be hurting my DPS by like 3% right now. But yeah, good call. Boom, 24%. So Monk has a ton of options for upping your toughness early season. Here I'm, you know, as fully ogged as I, you know, not as fully ogged as I can be. Hmm. Maybe I'll throw that on if that's the only one I'm missing. Okay, this is kind of sketch because that means I'm going to be using a main gem. Or LOD maybe? SO, let's use SO. I don't think I need that for anything if I should want to do any more build guides. Maybe before I use this esoteric alteration as an augment, I should finish that thought. So Monk has lots of avenues for increasing its toughness. Right now, when I am have all this main stat and a decent amount of vitality and also some life per hit, uh, yeah, that's my only role, but it's a good one. It's going to be pretty easy to survive with this build, but let's say I have 8,000 decks and 5,000 vitality, it might be quite a bit harder. So I have the Desert Shroud, I have the 40% dodge after dashing. There's a little bit of trick to keeping the toughness up though. So some people early season were using Spirit Guards here. I use Binding of the Lost, I think it's better. It definitely has a more powerful defense, but also I think it's easier to maintain. Um, so this is every time you seven side strike and it actually hits for all 14 strikes uh, You get 70% damage reduction, which is massive spirit guards is only 60 which means uh, Things go from this version hurting you by 30% to hurting you by 40% which is a one-third more Incoming damage so it doesn't sound like that much like Oh, it's 60 versus 70, but on the receiving end, <laughs> it's pretty huge. Probably the biggest worry with this is that you might be running around trying to pull stuff, or you're right on top of your pull, you're not really moving around much, but it's too early, you don't want to deal damage yet, and your seven seconds are ticking down, ticking down. You can't ever let this drop off. If it drops off, things are hurting you by... A almost four times as much as they used to be hurting you. So you can proc or die real quick. So you'd never ever want this to drop off. The other risk is that you might have a really low enemy and then it's just, say you have a power pylon especially, and then boom, one hit. Or you just have a whole bunch of swarms in one spot. So it's like four hits and they're all gone. Then all of a sudden, instead of having 70% damage reduction, you have 20%. So instead of taking 30 per hit, 30 incoming damage, you're taking 80 per hit. So just by having only four hits kill off everything in that one spot, that means as you move forward, everything's going to be hurting you by over twice as much until you get a good 14 stack again. So that's something to be watching out for is never let it drop off. And if you ever happen to like only get a few hits and then get interrupted. Maybe they teleport away. Maybe you kill it off early. Uh, watch out for that because that can be really dangerous in the next area. If you're just beginning on the build, I would suggest not even doing Captain Crimson's. Just do Spirit Guards and then you can wear the six piece and wear Binding of the Lost. And then since you don't need Ring of Royal Grandeur, you can also do <laughs> Unity and be super duper tanky. It's it was amazing like that was a very tanky version of the build before they added in 77 percent damage reduction but the thing is like captain crimson's it's really good for it because right now uh i'm probably going to be getting about 68 percent or so more damage out of it and also i'll be able to attack more often because of it and i didn't need to roll as many cooldown rolls on gear to get to that level by a lot because of the 20 percent cooldown so it did it probably like doubles the damage of the build but doubling the damage like just from a strict sense is about five gr tiers so you can do five gr tiers lower with like eight times the toughness if you're wearing binding of the lost you're wearing or cubing spirit guards 
you've got the one bracer and the cube, you're wearing the other, and you're doing a unity with the build. I think for a little bit I was doing that, but I took the unity out for SOJ. You could also do a focus and restraint version with that. You cannot get rid of convention of elements because that helps the build so much. But yeah, that's, that's so much tankier version of the build. Here, most people go mythic rhythm. I don't do mythic rhythm. Like maybe... I'm misunderstanding how complex it is, but I think other people, like most of the people running it, misunderstand it the other way. They think that it's just like an automatic thing. They look at the leaderboard, see people are running it, so they run it. Um, and it's just, it's not simple at all. But there's one part of the GR that it might be simpler, that might still make it worth it, that I don't know that much about because I don't run it. But um, I'll talk about that here a little bit. So we are doing harmony. This frees up a lot of your primaries on your gear. So like not having to worry about getting all res pretty much anywhere. You would rather have a single res like fizz res, fizz res, arcane res, fire res. Those things are really, really nice. So that means uh, you can have a lot of all res even when you don't have all res rolled onto your gear other than the shoulders where it just comes naturally. It also means that you can get all res out of your like rings, which you would never put all res on the top there, but, and this one didn't come with a single res, unfortunately. 200 fire res is basically 80 all res that I got on this ring because it's ancient, came with a high single res, and that just goes on to the big pool. So really like harmony for that sake. Uh, seize the initiative I have here to basically make the gameplay a little bit smoother throughout the GR and then stack stricken a little bit faster on the boss. I just glanced back at my 123 clear and it was <clears throat> about a five minute Ember fight. Ember is not a good boss. He uh, has adds the whole time, which is bad, but I think they were pretty manageable. It wasn't as bad as I thought it'd be. So I'm hoping today as I try some 125s that this will help a little bit if I get a nice single target boss. Beacon of Etar, I would say is mandatory. Same with near death experience. Even on softcore, I run near death experience, even though this is a very tanky build. It just means that you could screw up really badly and still be fine, as long as you don't do it more than once in the same minute. For that same reason, I'm running the Enchantress's Cheat Death. Uh, this one's got two minute cooldown. Yeah, it was between that and 6% attack speed, I'm gonna pick the Cheat Death there. You could definitely on softcore just try and run that and ignore uh, this one. But there's not that many other good choices. So there's Mythic Rhythm, which if you play it perfectly is a lot of extra damage. Uh, determination, this is 20% additive damage. So that means if you were getting 100% between Assimilation and your Exploding Palm rolls, then this only brings you from doing 200% to 220, which is only a 10% damage increase. Better than nothing, like that's the most of a tier worth of damage increase but yeah it's not as great as it looks at first and unfortunately like if it was 20 percent versus the boss when you don't have assimilation anymore that would be intriguing but it's not guardian's path is amazing uh, this used to always be my go-to second defense thing so harmony mandatory beacon of vitar mandatory on hardcore at least mandatory and then i would usually do uh the guardian's path when this build was a lot squishier. When they added in the 77% damage reduction for Exploding Palm, then I started experimenting with other things, and that's where I'm doing the CZ initiative. But if you needed more toughness, Guardian's Path is a good go-to. Another staple for more toughness is just swapping out. You could either do Gogok or Trapped for an Esoteric. It's a I always think of it as just 50% damage reduction. It's probably even a little bit more than that. Because like it says, 60% non-physical, and then uh, it jumps it up even a lot more when you're below 50% life. It kind of sucks for Rift Guardians, though, because I remember certain builds used it, and you'd be doing fine throughout the Rift. You'd get a lot more healing. You'd be stunning things and stuff, and this would be taking care of the bulk of incoming damage. So then you get to the physical Rift Guardian, <laughs> and this does nothing, and you just get stomped on so that's probably the biggest trade-off with esoteric is it's amazing defense 
until it isn't. So that is an Og now, which actually takes this uh, dex roll, makes it a little bit less valuable, but basically just still way better than a 7% damage roll. But it's kind of interesting because like, oh, I did my calculations before I did this Og, or if I had done it before I did this Og, then now I would be pretty far different than I was back then. That's why I always tell people you can't really base anything on just the piece of gear, what the right roll is. You need to look at your overall stats. Okay, so why does our damage increase so much when we have lots and lots of enemies? Well, one is that Exploding Palm is an area of effect skill, like almost every skill in the game. It explodes, hits all nearby enemies, and damages them. So as we're exploding, exploding palms, multiple enemies get hit. If you could hit 10 enemies with it, it's going to be 10 times as much progress per unit of time as if you were only hitting one enemy. So that's one way it scales. Another is area damage. So in this case, if there are six enemies within 10 yards of each other, all of them, then I deal 138% more damage. If there's 11 enemies, I deal twice that much more damage. If there was only two enemies next to each other, I deal, I think, one-fifth of this amount more damage. It's, it's like you get 20% of this for every enemy past the first one. So you get no benefit from just fighting one enemy. But yeah, six is where the crossover where you get this exact amount more damage. So if you have, like I said, 11 enemies, then I'm doing about three time, uh, 3.7 times my original damage. And also, I'm hitting 11 enemies at a time instead of uh, just hitting one enemy. So that's two ways that it massively scales as you have more enemies in a small spot. A third reason that it's really nice to have lots of enemies in one spot is assimilation. So this is additive damage. It, if you have uh, two rolls of exploding palm, 30%, then it goes from your doing 130% exploding palm damage up from there so it would go to 135 140 145 150 um, so it's not exactly like 20 stacks isn't exactly doubling your damage it would be missing about uh, a third of it whatever you would think it would do so if it's plus 50 percent it's that minus a third of 50 if it's plus 100 percent it's that minus a third of 100 if you have two rolls i only have one roll so it's actually a little bit more beneficial than that for me <laughs> So I get uh, minus 15% multiplicative to the number. Anyway, um, if I'm getting a big stack of assimilation, uh, then that those attacks do way more damage. So that's area damage. That's the fact that's an AOE skill. And that's the fact that I'm going to have a bigger assimilation. And all these things multiply against each other for way, way more damage. Okay, kind of the last thing, and this applies to most builds in the game as well, is uh, I'm going to kind of combine two is Endless Walk and Oculus Ring. So if you're not playing with a follower with an Oculus, you should be. Um, I don't re really remember what gear I put on this. I know this is the big patch where followers can't have gear now, but I didn't really pay that too much attention to it. I didn't min-max it. But Oculus has always been a standby. Give your follower an <laughs> Oculus Ring. Even if it has dex, doesn't matter because this one already has 25,000 int. 85% is very important on the Oculus if you can get it. So the reason that that scales with density is because uh, you get to an area and you start killing things, an Oculus appears. You can use that Oculus to ki continue killing things in that area. It takes a while to kill the first things when you're doing really high-end pushes. So let's say I'm just going to pick all these thing targets around town. Let's say... Templar, Scoundrel, Kadala, this Obelisk, this Flag, Tyrael, Lorath, they all come at me, and then they're standing right here. It might take me two cycles to take one of them down, but once I take one of them down, I'm dealing double damage, basically, for the rest of that fight. So let's say I take down Tyrael, uh, and then I stand in Oculus while I fight the rest of them. I'm doing extra damage. Um, if all I was fighting was these two guys or even like worse if i was just fighting one uh then the oculus appears and it's useless i got no benefit out of that if i'm fighting two then i get to use the oculus to finish off the other one but if i've pulled 50 enemies to a spot and let's say it still takes me like a cycle or two to start killing enemies 
then there's a whole lot of things to deal double damage to for a while. Maybe some of them are on the edge that I haven't even been able to hit this whole time. Um, I get to start taking them down at a much faster rate from full health, whereas um, if my attack is able to literally hit everything on the screen, then a lot of stuff is going to be low health already, so I don't really get that full benefit out of it. But yeah, uh, it really benefits playing around the Oculus to have a giant pull and or to pull forward the things that are almost dead after a pull. So Oculus Ring benefits from having a whole lot of enemies. Um, and I was going to say Endless Wog is kind of tied to that because you don't want to like be repositioning all the time. If you pull, you know, these guys over here, then pull these guys over here, and now you've got like four screens worth of stuff, then you can settle down. And during that, you know, just a little bit of time that you spent being on defensive and not being able to deal much damage, now you can be on offensive while you plow through everything that you've just pulled together. So pulling, 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 and then killing. On really, really good mob types, you won't have to pull that far, like just a few screens on a big open map, and that'll be where you want to set down. But I've had times, I remember on like Whirlwind Barb, where I was pulling an entire map of big spiders on a battlefield just because I could. <laughs> and then I just kind of set up and waited, and I'd try and stack up Rampage if I could, but I'd have the Oculus pop out, pop over to the Oculus, ground stomp things towards it, just try and, and just sat there and waited for like a minute while I just tried to kill the whole map. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I forgot one very important to this build uh, thing that scales with density. And it never really even hit me until maybe it was this season or last season, but sometime recently playing Yuliana's, it, it makes a lot of sense. I forgot about the exploding palm going off on death because it seems so inconsequential in a GR where your first hits are barely killing anything on a high level, and you're literally, every time you attack, you get 14 explosions. So, like, how how much could the deaths be doing? Probably not much at all, is what I thought. But then I realized, let's say that you have a whole bunch of swarms in one spot, and you get your assimilation, you get your offense on uh, Endless Walk, you get an Oculus before cold you set up and you've got all this going for you you've got like double damage double damage triple damage you not only have your 14 explosions dealing all of that extra damage but you also if you've killed like 30 swarms you've gone from doing 14 explosions to doing 44 explosions while you have all those multipliers it's no wonder that very, very tiny mob types deal are very, very good for this build. They stack better for more area damage, but also every time one of them dies, that's 1 14th extra damage from your original 14 strikes uh, that you get during that cycle. So if you can really juice up all of your damage for one solid attack where you've set up well and you're in an Oculus, oh my gosh, this it's a huge difference if you get a really good mob type on a really open map compared to just an average one. All right, almost forgot to talk about Mythic Rhythm. So every third hit from a spirit generator increases the damage of your next damaging spirit spender by 40%. Sounds like a ton of damage. It's like two tiers of damage that you could get for just using a passive. And now that this build is tankier than it used to be, like passive slots are a lot more free than they used to be. That's why I'm using Seize the Initiative, which isn't really that useful. But I, I just don't like playing around Mythic Rhythm. So the way I think that works is when you punch, like you get to a bunch of enemies, you punch them three times, you actually use up your Mythic Rhythm on that third punch when it applies Exploding Palms. But if you had several enemies there, then some of them will have it and some, well, one of them will have it and the rest will not. I'm not sure that that's the way it works. That might just be the way it used to work. But let's say that doesn't work that way. Well, if it does work that way, then you have to punch six total times. The one time makes one of them have a good, the other is bad. But then the second time, since everything already had Exploding Palm on it, it gives you the ability to apply a stronger Exploding Palm somewhere else. So if that's not the way it works, then you only have to punch three times at the first location. If it is the way it works, you have to punch six. 
But anyway, after you do that, you basically leave. <laughs> you go somewhere else. Don't want those exploding palms mixing in somewhere else. You get to somewhere else. Hopefully, there's just like a guy kind of on his own near a bunch of other enemies, but not in the middle of a bunch of enemies. Because you, what you're going to be doing is you're going to exploding palm them with a juiced up exploding palm. Pa! And then you're going to spread that to others. So I feel like back in season six, I still manually exploding palmed just to get area damage, even though I wasn't using mythic rhythm. And it was kind of hard for me to spread sometimes because I would try and seven side strike and it would hit every enemy around the one that I had exploding palmed. And sometimes it wouldn't hit them one time, let alone hitting them and actually spreading it to everything in the area. So that's like, so far that's two levels of extra inconveniences. One, you have to do this thing before you even start attacking anything. And then when you do, you might uh, like just miss them. Maybe with a little practice that you would never miss anymore. But uh, that's just something I remember from season six being annoying. From that point, you have to make sure that you do not punch three times on anything unless it already has an exploding palm on it because you don't want to have some of them be bad and some of them be plus 40% because you don't know which one then you'll spread to more things in the area. You kind of want to be on a giant open map. It's a lot more important for the Mythic Rhythm version if you're playing around it to be on a giant open map than for not playing with that. Like Obviously, you're going to do way better on an open map than without one. But I've had times where I'm skipping floors like they're not that good of floors, but they're swarms or something. And just every 20 seconds, I stop, do a pop and keep time that way. And if I was trying to play around Mythic Rhythm, that would be way more difficult. So I really think it just adds a big extra layer of inconvenience. Where I think it could still have tons of value if it works a certain way. I'm not sure it works this way, but... If on single target, punch three times, you get a juiced up exploding palm on them. That means the Rift Guardian is like guaranteed plus 40% damage, almost a furnace on the Rift Guardian. Like you could probably save a minute on Rift Guardian fights if you take Mythic Rhythm. In that case, like obviously it's way better than CZ Initiative, but I don't know that that's the way it works. It probably wouldn't be too hard to test, but ah. Uh maybe another day, but you might notice if you are checking how long a single target Rift Guardian takes and you try it with CZ Initiative, or you probably won't even go CZ Initiative. There's other choices, but <clears throat> if you are comparing a single target boss to another single target boss, it should be really easy to notice a 40% damage increase. All right, I've got 134 keys, so hopefully I can get some really decent GR and kind of show off what this build can do. I'm looking for small mobs on a big map. Okay, <laughs> nice. Oh man, this monitor's a little bit bigger or else it's closer than uh, my old one. Wow, and we got mothers over there, okay. So we wanna sell down because we're coming up on cold. We just got a big Oculus. Watch this, amazing. So that is really ideal. So much. So I wanna settle down again. Anytime after the midpoint of lightning, we wanna get a kill. Before that, the Oculus will disappear before cold. Wow, more mothers. So this is a really good mob type because we have the grotesque to so leave behind worms, which means more adds even after we've killed something. And then the mothers, you know, when you can get them, it's even more stuff. I have done some serious damage to these elites. This is kind of a squishy version of the build. I was using an extra defensive passive until just now, uh, but last time I pushed it, I only had 1600 selling. Paragon, so I felt like I was probably a lot tougher. This was obviously a way worse prepped rotation. Looks like it might be a, a loop even. Wow, we are so set up for success if we don't die. Okay, watch Epiphany, it's down. Seven side strike makes you invincible, so that's a good thing. <laughs> we have our first pylon. 
very early, which means we're likely to get four. <clears throat> At least three, right? Okay, unfortunately, this is these have been some bad DPS cycles, but I've been kind of just keeping all my defense up while pulling. So we should be able to do some mega DPS here in a bit. Let's keep pulling. All right, let's try and get an Oculus. Oh, no, we didn't quite get it. I'm just going to hold for cold. Boom. Not as good as if we had an Oculus the whole time, but still really good. Okay, and then I'm gonna just chill for a while. More summoners type stuff, like ads for days. Okay, now we're gonna try and DPS again. And we didn't quite set it up well enough for cold. It was bad uh, density, but we killed two elites. So that's sweet. Hopefully these guys follow me up here because this density was mega good. Don't let the belt buff drop off. I know this looks like this was the first key I opened, but it was technically the second. <laughs> the first one uh, was a Halls of Agony. But yeah, this is an amazing floor. Very much could go higher, it looks like. But I could also fail this, because who knows, there's probably some bad ads bosses that would just add infinite time, like take almost 15 minutes to kill a boss on its own. <laughs> Come on. All right, so we'll try and set this up for the next one. Looks like there's nothing in that corner. Just go ahead and grab this. Shield pylon is really good because you can just absolutely do the best timing possible. Timing, placement, everything without having to worry about dying. If you have enough cooldown, you can try and get two, uh, two seven-side strikes in on the same cold cycle. So that's what I just did there. I went right at the beginning of cold, and then I got a few of the strikes in on the next one. Let's try and get an Oculus. It, it'd be better to get a Oculus, though. I'm going to try and get a little more assimilation. I think I went from 15 to 16. So those are a couple of choices that you can make on the fly. Is Will I be able to set up an Oculus in time? If not, is this cycle even worth, or should I just keep pulling and pulling and try and really set up the next cycle well? Because the worst thing you can do in some cases, especially on less ideal maps, is actually blow up a portion of the trash, and then like your next cycle is going to suck as well, because of all the earlier things I stated about scaling with density. So you really want to make uh, most of your DPS be just really big hits on cold, and then the rest of the time just kind of soften stuff up, and maybe spawn an Oculus, but not kill much more than that. Um, just like DPSing, like seven side strike, seven side strike in the same spot constantly, that's like a really bad move. You definitely don't want to be doing that generally, unless you're at the boss. So here I'm going to wait for the second half of Lightning. I assumed I'd get an Oculus. I was starting to worry. We don't have much for ads. I can tell by the assimilation. This is a way that I've actually been able to judge density in any GR is from all my time playing Yuliana's Monk. I just like got a feel for like, oh, I've got this many enemies, so it must be blank per 10 yards because I would get like 15 assimilation stacks. So this was obviously a dead cycle. I basically did nothing. Um, there was a ton of trash here, but then nothing out after this. This might be the only elite, in which case I probably won't kill it. I'll probably leave it and go down. Okay, 13 stacks kind of sucks. But yeah, we killed so many elites so easily just from the amazing trash. Trash MVP. I'm going to check this because I've had some times where I just didn't quite go into the full corner and missed a pylon, and I hated it. So we're definitely not winning yet. Like we're in as good of a spot as we need to be to win, but it's not guaranteed by a long shot. We want to have probably a five minute lead for that to just guarantee it versus a normal boss. But if it's a bad boss, we could need more than that. Boom, get out. There's nowhere we're killing that elite unless we find a conduit right now. Terrible follow-up floor. The mobs aren't great either. We have no pylons. So here you got a choice to make. 
bad floor. Do you do what I'm doing and stop for a, like the biggest room you're gonna find and try and get uh, like 2% out of this or whatever I got just now? I'm gonna do one more hit. And then risk spawning a pylon in a place you don't really want it. Or do you just skip entirely? So like you can skip really fast with this build. And I think now I'm gonna make that decision, just keep skipping. So the problem with if I were to have stopped there is I don't think I would have been to the offense on Endless Walk yet. So I wouldn't have even probably killed most of the stuff on cold. I didn't have time to prep it, grab it. It, it wasn't a really fast moving to the center mob type like say Swarms or Ice Clan where I could have just vacuumed a bit and then a lot more ran in. So I don't think I would have killed much even if I had. It's a really bad trash type. Bad floor. This would be like a death sentence for a close Tempest Rush run. Not as bad because I don't have to click to open doors and I can move really fast. Um, you can actually skip a lot of floors without losing a lot of time. And really, I could any percent now spawn a conduit and also a power on this run. I've only found two pylons. Even if I only find a power, I could lose a lot of this lead and probably still win with a decent boss and a power. We'll see. Oh dear. <laughs> so it's succubus is emblazing whatever's. I think this room will be worth. See if we can get an Oculus. We did. We actually started killing things early and killed everything but the grotesques. So now we are skipping. Um, you can epiphany teleport. Uh oh. <clears throat> it's not letting me skip. Is there a door? There's not. I must have been not trying to dash to the right spot. I'm also reaffirming that I have all of my buffs up that I want. Shoot, I got the bad pylon that was left. It'll be okay for skipping though. It's a dangerous thing while skipping floors. It was more dangerous last season while I was using focus restraint, no endless walk. But endless walk at least doubles your toughness as you run through things. But you might drop off on your gogok, which means longer epiphany downtime. Um, and it's really easy to go more than seven seconds without seven side striking or using exploding palm. I sometimes manual exploding palm like just there, just for the defense sake. I'm not trying to you know, do a area damage or mythic rhythm. I'm just trying to make sure I have that massive, massive defense boost. Okay, so at this point, I should be about through here, but I'm also losing lots of time and this seems like a big floor. Okay, three. Okay, better map, better mobs. Can we find a nice juicy pull? Like I think, I think that's all the stuff we're gonna find from there. I'm not worried about dealing any damage right now. Mm, up there looks even a little bit better. I think we're gonna hit, so down is probably a dead end, up is the way forward, right? Nothing in the dead end. I don't want to drag that elite or its minions. That wouldn't really benefit me at all. Based on how much damage that stuff took off of cold. Yeah, this doesn't seem like that high of a tier anymore. Because <laughs> this is a stocky mob type. Like, it does not go down easy and it is just getting melted. It wasn't in the highest of density either. Okay, go to offense, endless walk. Try to pull together. Keep my assimilation. So right there, I did, uh, I got my 17 assimilation stacks. Did my explosion on the beginning of cold. Uh, that killed a lot of stuff, but I hopped to the Oculus for the end of cold. But even though I had time to punch three times again, I intentionally did not left click a bit so that I would uh, keep the 17 stacks for my next attack. I do that sometimes uh, if I get a really big number, especially if I kill a bunch of the stuff in the area. I know I'm going to just overwrite it with a smaller number, so I just hold it. There, I just held none. <laughs> um, yeah, we got to keep moving. We are not going to kill any elites on this floor unless they like happen to be in an even bigger pool of trash than anything I've seen. 
Now you can kind of drag and kill larger trash like Punishers on more open maps. So you can treat them like baby elites and that also goes for most builds where you would never kill them in one pull where you've killed off everything and they're still alive. But if you do a few, they're still worth good progress. <clears throat> so they can be worth dragging. This is looking like I'm gonna need either a good boss, like a binder or Saxtrus, or, you know, I could still find a power for boss. Okay, I think that was just in time. That'll have it for cold. Maybe I, no, that punisher is too far out of the way. You really want to make sure everything is squeezed together before your big DPS. So there, I had plenty of extra time. If things were spread out, then you have a strike over here, a strike over there, a strike down there. Like it does not deal nearly as much damage as if each one of those strikes has a whole bunch of enemies on top of them. So you, that's what Cyclone Strike is for. It can't pixel pull but it can group things when they need to be grouped. There I didn't need to, but it just reminded me of that fact that sometimes you'll set up and maybe you have things that can't be pulled that will really pull your hits away. It's actually a really big deal on Rift Guardians because if you have just two enemies and half of your strikes go to the second enemy and it's not within exploding palm range of the first, then your first is not taking much damage. So that's why I say bad adds bosses can take like infinite time. So if this was, okay, it's a really good mob type. I think I went the wrong way. But this is a sort of thing where it's like, yeah, because I'm not using mythic rhythm, I don't have to worry about the fact that I got a bad map so much. Because I'm not gonna have to try and drag those things forward even though the next pull was pretty close. Uh, we gotta get our exploding palm buff. Okay. I thought I would be able to pull this into more stuff. So far I've seen two subpar rooms. Like both of them were a little smaller than I was expecting for the mob type. The mob type is great. We have, what was that? Four minutes, crap. <laughs> so maybe one key dream didn't happen. We'll see. Um, yeah, I definitely don't have time without a power. Let's look for a power. Reflect damage can hurt a lot, I've noticed. So I don't know if that was saying me or if I just dropped buffs, but that was how I died last season with, I think my first monk was reflect damage when back at me. These guys aren't even reflect damage. Get out of here. Now, unfortunately I only need 1%, but it would take me so long to get 1% out of this spread out stuff that even though I'm looking for 1%, I actually have to still find a big pull because of the scaling exponential damage increase in density. Uh, I've, this is probably 1% of trash or more, but it would take me several cycles to kill it all if it's, you know, not much. Okay, now between these two rooms, we got some. I'm gonna go off of cold. <laughs> oh, perfect. Okay, well, that's some juicy density. I don't think we got power. Shoot. All right, so not a clear, but I pretty much had given up my D3 season anyway. But as you can see, like this is probably 127 plus viable right now, just my build like this, which would be kind of cool to reclaim uh, hard uh, soft core rank one again. Let's see, this is uh, overall, but if you just go to Yuliana's right now, I saw somebody had cleared a 126, and I'm like, oh, I don't think I could beat that since my last one was 123. But yeah, I could totally beat that <laughs> if I you know, fished a few hundred keys, had a riff like this, but with a better follow-up and power for boss. Yeah, 127, definitely. That floor one was amazing though, but anyway, just, you know, for science. Unless it's like Razael, then maybe I won't even do this for science. We got three minutes. Literally one of the worst bosses. Oh no. So like Choker and Perendi were two that have plagued me so much for uh, like G.O.D. days. Cause they're, they're ads, they're ads. <clears throat> uh, 
What do you think? Five minutes? Eight minutes? Ten minutes? All right, so I spawned it uh, just past 12 minutes, and the final time was... Yeah, it was basically a five-minute fight. It went a lot better than I was expecting, to be honest. Just shows how low the tier was, relatively. All right, 125 seemed too easy, so I'm going to see if I can uh, pass. All right, currently I have five tiers on rank two on the hardcore Yuliana's board, but I'm going to see if I can pass the softcore Yuliana's board and clear a 127 with less than half the paragon of this person. But, like, obviously, if this person could do uh, 124 or 1500, then you don't need nearly this much to do a 126. Actually, this person could probably do a 126 just based on that time. Dang. So, here we go, 127. This is not going well. Um, I'm just doing it in case like the next floor is amazing, but only barely shy and the floor af floors after at all terrible. Like this isn't terrible. It's just not good. <laughs> Maybe I kept time there. What? Oh my gosh, I should have skipped it. <laughs> but I couldn't have known that. And actually, this is a good candidate for maybe this will only give me 34% if I only kill swarms. I also definitely missed a pylon somewhere. Whew! You see that progress? Oh, yeah. Best case scenario right here. It's not the best layout, but... Whew! Do I even need cold? Oh, my gosh. We'll use cold somewhere else. Lordy. Just like, progress bar, how fast do you want to fill up? Compare this to the last floor that was also storms. Oh my gosh. Mothers. Can we get a freaking power pylon? Make this a 12 minute run. We still might find a, I'm going to say fourth pylon. I assume this is the third and I missed one somewhere. <laughs> Could potentially save that for boss, especially because it looks like it was an illusionist. That could have been actually really helpful. Uh, channeling equals a lot of extra damage between Cap and Crimsons and just being able to seven side strike more. And then the adds after I've stacked a bunch of stricken would have probably like been super good. Gosh, what a great mob type. Totally balanced. See if I can get to 99. Nope. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. The most one shottiest boss there is. Okay. So this is kind of a silly plan. Kind of a. I feel like I've tried this plan a lot of times with Razael and it never works. Never quite pays off. But here's my thinking. I stack stricken faster while he's above three quarters health. He doesn't one shot me while he's above three quarters health. So maybe I just stack stricken for five minutes and then that greatly reduces the amount of time I have to fight him while he can hurt me a lot. That probably won't work because I think with just like the other two minutes, I wouldn't actually kill him. I think we're there. So might as well, uh, dang it. <laughs> He's like, might as well attack. And then he does his thing. Yeah, I'm just going to attack on cooldown for the most part. Maybe save the dashing strikes. Well, I failed that one. <gasps> Watch out for that. Slowed projectiles. Thanks, Enchantress. Okay, I'm doing lots of damage, though. He slowed. Maybe won't be as scary, but he was. Wow, that's really long distance. That was like a perfect demonstration of how far away from something you can be and still hit it with a seven side strike. Like say an Aki, he is doing that such bad timing. I almost ran to another bullet, but I think I was still invincible. Ugh. I know I've pretty much given up on the season, but I still wanna get this win. So real quick for this guy, 
It's unfortunate that my offense is tied to my invincibility. So like when I was playing the G.O.D. Demon Hunter last season, I could hit smoke screens, even though that buffed my defense via elusive ring when I was using it. Um, I was fine just not casting it until he was about to do his thing. I can't just not cast my offensive thing that's also tied to like a tripling of my toughness. I can't just not cast seven side strike while I'm fighting him until he shoots his holy bolt. So it's kind of a pickle. It's And because it has a certain amount of animation time to do the whole seven side strike, that means sometimes I cast it like the holy bolt is coming out and I can't get out of there when I want to be able to get out of there. So yeah, wait, I shouldn't be going back yet. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, there's no real defense I can get up ahead of time. So there. I saved it because I hadn't been doing anything. Okay, we've got all of our toughness up. Just going to attack on cooldown and try and run away. Oh, man. She did not block that like she should have. Okay. Um, why are you trying to block the door, dude? We'll probably just be sitting here for the next uh, half of the health bar, no matter what. All right, can we kill him in less than a minute from this point? Nice. Okay, we'll save the next one for the beginning of cold. Nice. That way we can get two in on cold. It's not looking great. Ah, shoot. Just a tiny bit more aggressive and I would have gotten the clear. Darn. That was really long. Hope that helped, though. Have a good one.